You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Andreas Steno. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. My name is Andreas Steno. I'm the founder and CEO of Steno Research. And uh, this week is a slightly special week in the Macro Sunday podcast, as I am sending to you live on air from Mallorca, Spain. And um, therefore, I'm all by myself this week. Um, But before we get to the guest of the week, because I have been able to get a guest remotely um, for this Macro Sunday podcast, I'd like to elaborate a bit on some of my thoughts on what's ongoing, both geopolitically, but also in financial markets. And the guest of the week is one of the best strategists I know. Um, the chief investment officer of Saxo Bank, Steen Jacobson, will join us in, say, 10 minutes' time to discuss everything related to commodity markets, investments through a period of geopolitical turmoil, and all of that. I look very much forward to that. But before we get uh, Steen on the podcast, allow me just a few seconds. And um, first of all, I think we've once again very clearly had a week of curve steepening in the dollar curve. We've had a week of um, weak appetite for very long-term bonds. Uh, and it basically fits hand in glove with the thesis uh, that I've presented over the course of, say, the summer and the early autumn in this podcast. So why is the curve steepening and why do I actually think that we've had new fuel for that thesis over the course of the past week? First of all, we're currently stuck with a very odd mixture of economic trends, both in the US economy, but also elsewhere around the globe. We have early signs of what I will call a restocking cycle within the manufacturing sector. So basically companies stocking inventories as a consequence of lower input prices over the course of the past three to four quarters. So purchasing managers are loading up on inventories, meaning that the activity gauges in manufacturing will actually improve decently through the fourth quarter. And that's very odd because that's typically something that we see in the very early innings of a new cycle. Um, The question here is whether the disconnect that we've seen between manufacturing and services will continue into 2024, leaving services on the decline despite this Uh, pick up in activity in manufacturing. That will wrong foot right about everyone if it happens because all recession models are based on manufacturing activity. Uh, No matter the amount of thousands of PhDs that the Federal Reserve hires or the ECB hires, we will still end up with recession models very closely connected to the manufacturing PMI. And therefore, if we get such a small activity rebound in manufacturing while services will actually decline further. We will wrong foot right about everyone in global macro with such a scenario. That's basically my main thesis right now. So Q1 recession is likely next year, despite these um, green shoots in manufacturing. But back to the consequences for the yield curve, because if you look at such a tick up in manufacturing activity. It's typically what you would label a cyclical uptick in the global economy. And when we get such a cyclical uptick in activity, it typically also means that, say, the 10-year point, even the 30-year point uh, of the yield curve will rise as a consequence of it, because you basically uh, readjust growth expectations alongside this tick up in activity and manufacturing. And I think that's likely uh, one of the drivers behind the recent sell off in US Treasuries. So, with the tick up in manufacturing activity, with a record issuance pace through Q4 from the US Treasury, um, also in longer durations than just bills, with continued rising geopolitical risk premiums currently as a consequence of what's ongoing in the Middle East, and with a risk, I'd say, that the Federal Reserve will not react to sticky inflation from here, you basically have the perfect storm for a uh, curve steepener um, in a positive sense, right? 
everything points to the curve steepener. And also, trends abroad confirm this view of a curve steepener. Most importantly, foreign demand is still lukewarm at best uh, as a consequence of this inverted curve in the US. Um, when you FX hedge a purchase of a 10 year US Treasury in Japan or China, it's simply just a bad equation right now because of the spread paid on the, on the FX hedge, say the three month spread between um, Shibor and, um, and Sofer. For example, uh, the spread between short-term dollar rates and short-term renminbi rates, it's just too wide to really um, incentivize anyone to buy longer duration in dollars and FX hedge at the same time, which is typically the mandate they, that they have, those uh, lifers uh, pension funds. So the foreign demand is weak. Um, this week, or rather last week, we had a new confirmation from Japan that they're starting to fear the sticky inflation picture a bit more. Um, ahead of the meeting concluding the 31st of October, it is likely that Bank of Japan will um, create a task force uh, to look into the inflation picture. And if we look at the most recent inflation projection from the Bank of Japan, they have 2.5% penciled in for the fiscal year of 23, so until April next year. Um, in, in normal um, terms. And we haven't had one single print below 3% so far in the fiscal year of 23 in Japan. We will not get a print below 3% likely over the course of, say, the next three, four, five months. So basically, the entire year is above 3% in inflation terms. Bank of Japan will have to hike the expectations for the fiscal year of 23 to plus 3%, likely even to 3.1, 3.2, that area. That's the only feasible thing here. Um, I mean, I cannot imagine anything else because it does not make sense to keep the inflation forecast lower than that. In July, they hiked the inflation forecast for 23, while at the same time accompanying that inflation forecast hike with a decline in the expectations for 2024. So they moved the needle from 2% to 1.9% in 2024, likely to kind of sugarcoat the measures a bit and to try and avoid uh, large consequences for local bond markets, etc. This time, they probably have to hike both 23 and 24 at the same time, also given uh, expectations, for example, in the 10 can survey, so three year ahead in inflation expectations among companies, um, also given uh, inflation expectations embedded in, in inflation swaps, etc. There are a load of reasons why they should increase 24 as well. They will likely try and be dovish in 25 to at least allow themselves to, to continue the printing press but because that's essentially the most almost hilarious part of this Japanese story right now, Bank of Japan is en route to deliver a record nominal amount of purchases of JDBs in 2023. That's policy normalization, right? Um, it's simply fake news that Bank of Japan is close to normalizing policy, if you ask me, uh, because they've had to accompany the move moves that they've made in the yield curve with extreme buying. So extreme QE. Uh, and that's obviously why the Japanese yen is so weak versus peers. So if they move the needle again on October 31st due to this inflation forecast change, I think they will. Uh, let's say that they move the needle 25 or 50 basis points in the yield curve control again. Then it will likely be accompanied by a truckload of buying from the Japanese central bank again. Uh, so do not be surprised if we get, say, a move of 15, 20 basis points in the 10-year bond, in the um, Japanese uh, government bond yield curve, at the same time as a 2-3% weaker yen. That is kind of my base case right now. Um, and we've been on the clearly on the right side of the, this bet over the past 3-4 months, saying that Japanese yields would pick up also in relative terms to, to quite a few peers in the area. Uh, but still, the Japanese yen would weaken. Uh, and if you look at real yields versus uh, US dollar yields, I, I think it's fair to label uh, the Japanese yen as, as overvalued still. Um, the fair value in dollar yen is probably around 162, 163, if you look at it from a relative yield uh, spread perspective, 
in real terms. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, uh, of major relevance for Bank of Japan. So what I'm ultimately saying here is that Bank of Japan will once again put pressure on global bond markets. The ramifications will be felt in the West, uh, and a steeper curve is needed to tempt back foreign demand because of high uh, FX hedging costs, uh, because of... Uh, of the spreads of short-term interest rates relative to long-term interest rates. So the curve cannot be inverted for long in the U.S., and we're slowly but surely moving towards an uninversion. The big question is whether that exact uninversion of the yield curve is a recession trigger or a recession signal in itself. Um, if we take the French example as the most sort of recent empirical evidence, the French curve re-inverted or uninverted um, over the course of, of September, October here. And it basically happened exactly alongside the complete landslide in the composite PMI in France, uh, below 44 in, in levels, etc. So I actually think there is some merit to this curve signal of an uninversion being an actual recession signal. Um, even if it happens due to a bear steepening trend rather than a bull steepening trend. And the French empirical evidence is the best recent example of that. But I'm very curious to see whether my guest of the week, Steen Jacobson, the chief investment officer of Saxo Bank, agrees. Steen is a tremendous analyst and um, also with a load of experience from the buy side of this macro equation. And um, no one's better than Steen at assessing how to deal with a load of um, risk factors from politics, geopolitics, and um, those ramifications in relation to that. So um, as per usual, we'll introduce Steen with a piece of music. And since Steen is a uh, fellow Dane, I thought it would be appropriate to introduce Steen with the Viking Warrior song. Great pleasure to introduce Mr. Steen Jakobsen, an old friend of mine, but also one of the best analysts out there to the Macro Sunday podcast, the Chief Investment Officer of Saxo Bank, among other things on your curriculum. Steen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andreas. Always a pleasure to be with you and your team. Steen, the um, current inflation picture was one that you warned about before it actually occurred. And uh, I remember a couple of interviews I've made with you over the course of 2021 and 2022, where you warned me that my generation would not be able to fully grasp this inflation picture. And uh, oh boy, you've been right. So Steen, if we start with the, the inflation debate first, what made you so certain about this inflation picture and how do you see it develop from here? So what made me a bit scared at the time was, of course, the classic sort of supply demand function in commodities and what the world needed in terms of uh, commodities, but also infrastructure and the likes. But I think the bigger point and a point that is still relevant today is that uh, if I can call it uh, inflation math, it's very difficult for people to understand. There is a number of mechanics that I almost think you have to have experienced before to understand both as an analyst, but also as a uh, as someone who's trying to predict the markets. And what I'm talking about here is uh, if we take the US, that social, social security, Medicare, and more importantly, tax brackets are inflationary, uh, are inflation linked. In other words, as soon as inflation picks up, all of these brackets gets higher uh, brackets. So you, you get uh, your, more earnings before you actually have you you have to pay taxes. Social Security, Ma Ma Medicare is uh, <clears throat> is going at the gross level of uh, inflation. So there are all these built-in uh, me mechanisms that people start uh, keep sort of underestimate 
after, of course, coming from 20 years of ever lower interest rate and lower uh, inflation. So I think what I call the inflation math is as something that people are finally sort of uh, owning up to now as we, as we sit here on, on the border of 5% in, in, t- in 10 years uh, US and, and an inflation rate, which over the course of the next two to three months will accelerate back up to 0.3, 0. 0.35% uh, month over month, which I think, you know, going back six months, going back 12 months, certainly going back three years, no one would ever thought we would be at this level. Hmm. So, Steve, the discussion on whether uh, the U.S. economy will face a soft landing, no landing at all, a hard landing, do you actually consider a recession a necessity to try and get this inflation picture changed? And what do you think will happen to the U.S. economy from here from a growth perspective? It's it's not classically in sort of the economic textbook one-on-one necessary, but the things that can actually free us from both uh, the debt uh, issue, the debt issuance and inflation, of course, is to increase significantly the productivity. Uh, I'm sorry to report that uh, that job is really poorly done because, of course, as we increase the debt relatively to productive factors in the economy, we also lower the threshold for uh, the ability of doing that job. So I, I will say, you know, not, not being 100 percent, but 90 percent needs to come from a slowdown of the economy, uh, in particularly, of course, in, in places like the UK and US, it needs to come through uh, consumer spending being reined in. I think it's happening very, very slowly. But again, the inflation math dictates that uh, that we, we, we will see and we continue to see that the uh, as we have with the last three data points from the US, that the consumer is actually right now in a place where he's not maxed out yet, despite the fact, which is a bit stunning, uh, astonishing to me, because if you look at the three ways of uh, the three big credit items in the US, if you look at credit card, it's now charging 25% a year, 2x the norm. If you look at mortgage rates, we just, as everybody probably noticed over the course of the week, we reached 8% in 30 year mortgages, uh, which is you know, one and a half X what we used to. And last but not least, uh, car financing at 48 months out is uh, it's also double running at uh, between 8 and 10%. So the additional spend that needs to happen from this time, in uh, this moment in time, uh, needs to be really need, uh, needed and, and really something that can change people's life because the cost of capital is simply going through the roof. Mm. So, Steve, why is the process of getting spending down so slow then? I mean, you've just listed the um, the cost of capital across various necessities basically for for consumers so why are they still spending like there's no tomorrow what 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 basically explains this well in the credit cards the numbers are are staggering up uh, to do exactly what we think they should do every single major bank in the u.s is reporting that the delinquencies that the uh, the people maxing out on the cards are increasing but if we take the other two components the housing market, there's a survey out recently from one of the local Fed banks saying that, you know, unlike what we saw in 7 8, most people today have a fixed mortgage. So a fixed mm-hmm. mortgage means that the housing market, uh, on, unlike what most people like to, to, to point to, it's not in a free fall. What's going on in the, in, the, in, the, in the housing market is that we have a standstill. We sort of have a Mexican standoff where the, there's certainly a bias strike because it's too expensive, the marginal cost of capital argument. But on the other side, you have people who sit in houses that are mortgaged at three, four percent. And if they would be selling the house, not only would they incur a higher interest rate, but also a massive uh, downsizing of the house they can actually buy for the dollar. So it's it's sort of, again, inflation math that dictates that the way we do it and, and, and the fixed and the same on the corporate side, to be honest. Uh, I think we are all focused, and I'm sure you and your partner has done a number of star- stories about the uh, the co- commercial real estate. But the fact is that commercial real estate, in terms of maturity on the debt, uh, venture capital, uh, private equity, most of the debt actually comes uh, through in 24, not in 23. So yes, uh, the renegotiation of debt is already very high, but the amount of debt that so far has been renegotiated and been going back to the market in terms of renewing 
financing uh, proposals are, are, are yet to come, and that will be a 24 story to me. So it's uh, what we all focus on is the lead lack of monetary policy. So inflation math plus lead and lacks is probably why we have ended up where we are. And I think the just to, to, to make a point here, I think the bond market is way out of control in terms of what they are asking for in terms of yield. Uh, mm. It's almost like the market is an autopilot and it's mainly driven by uh, by uh, CTAs and other people who uh, who are adding to the momentum every day. One mm. weak data point is the real catalyst test that we need. So to, if we see a you know, rising jobless claims or a, a inflation number that comes in on the south, it will be different. Unfortunately, I don't see inflation coming down, but maybe maybe the labor market starts to show up as you very well know the warn notices, which is every company over 100 uh, employees needs to warn 60 days ahead. Those numbers have been uh, rising significantly. So there are layoffs going on on a daily basis in the US right now, but yet again to show up in the actual data. Mm. Steen, amidst all this, the floodgates are wide open when it comes to the US public finances. Um, roughly 8% deficit relative to GDP in a, a time of low unemployment um, and so on. So what do you make of the fiscal side of the equation also in relation to this discussion you just opened on interest rates and bond markets? And I think that is the, the one thing that people underestimate the most was the fiscal side, specifically, mm-hmm. in, particularly in the US. Uh, the fiscal dominance, as we call it, is, is massive and, and, and strong. Uh, uh, the support that we've seen again through the tax bracket support and, and, and everything else I mentioned has been significant in excess of what people expected. My, my problem for, for the fixed income market and overall for the market itself is that I don't see anything that will actually rein in or stop the fiscal spend. Uh, Biden is now flying back to the US asking for additional $100 billion. And, and let me stress, I think it's, it's well worth uh, spending those $100 billion on on protecting uh, Israeli and 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 de- trying to ultimate the de-escalate the situation in the Middle East, but it's it's endless in terms of what's going on. And if you look ahead to next year, which I think we need to do with such a question, you know, right now it looks like a three horse race between Biden and Trump, and and of course the independent uh, Kennedy being there. None of these uh, gentlemen are in that process of saying. You know, similar to what Reagan did uh, back in the eighties, that we're gonna we're gonna control the spending. We're gonna go for uh, a fiscally tight uh, sort of budget. No, we're gonna see the opposite. Uh, when we see the European budgets coming up here in October, uh, uh, they will be expansionary. We've seen what Italy has already done. Uh, we know France is in a position where they can't afford it. We are in a position where uh, a country like France probably needs to step up its interior. Uh, uh, Security monitoring, uh, they need to transfer more money to pay for all the people driving tractors into the middle of Paris. Uh, mm. And I think that would be the theme across Europe and across the world, that fiscal spending is endless in, in its ability. And it, it, it goes back to this, and, and you know, to some extent, you have to give credit to the uh, modern monetary theory MMT people. They succeeded in actually implementing the MMT, i.e. the concept that you can issue debt with no cost. The problem is, of course, there is now a cost to it, but the first part of the plan what they were able to execute. But people forget that MMT, the way you you control the uh, expanding expenses is that you start to tax people, and the ability to tax is zero. And if the ability to tax is zero, then the fiscal deficit, as you outlined, is going to continue to be rising and becoming a bigger, bigger chunk of the actual budget itself in terms of the uh, debt times the interest rate that 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 they need to need issue at. So very concerned for the fiscal side. I think you know being in this market for whatever two hundred years as I have, I think ultimately the market reached as you say a breaking point. Fiscally, we are not there yet. Monetarily, we are beyond the breaking point. But you need fiscal also to come in in order to to make that breaking point more, uh, so to speak, more constructive uh, for the market. Steen, I know that you're currently touring clients around Europe. And uh, before we went on air, you told me that 
we kind of have an environment out there where the sentiment is getting very concerned again, or, or rather very worried about the situation, both in the Middle East, uh, but also uh, in terms of fiscal policy in the U.S. So what are your discussions around how to position for these uh, uncertain times in markets with your sparing partners currently? You're absolutely right, uh, Andres. Uh, people are very concerned about how to, uh, I wouldn't say hide, but how to hedge some of the risk that is embedded in the market. We come from a situation where whatever happens, equity goes up, real estate goes up, and uh, certainly we, we've seen uh, seen that the story still carry up in terms of return for this year, although, of course, a bit narrow in terms of the equity indices. But, but for me, uh, it's pretty clear there are three tools that, I want to advocate people use. One is gold. Uh, as JP Morgan famously said in 1908, uh, gold is money, the rest is paper, which is, I guess, what we just talked about in the first 24 minutes. Um, and I think she's absolutely right. They're, they're, you know, People are, are grasping for the gold. People are now finally sort of waking up to the fact that irresponsible uh, fiscal policy and inflation, break even rates are rising, is, is creating that demand. The market is net short. If you look at the ETFs, we have some of the lowest holdings of, of gold in uh, in recent history. The CTAs are still short. Uh, so I think the upside there is, is pretty uh, uh, amazing. And and the second part is that if you look 12, 18 months down the line, it's pretty clear to me that U.S. is reaching sort of the, as I indicated, the peak in interest rates. I'm not saying it's not going to go another one or even two interest rates, high, but we're at the end of the cycle which means that the ability to finance U.S. debt needs to increasingly come from a weaker dollar. And it's very interesting to me that since the last non farm payroll, the dollar has gone absolutely nowhere, actually slightly weaker, despite new highs in interest rates. So the correlation between ever higher interest rates in the U.S. and the strong dollar has broken, at least for now. And if it is broken, it's sort of indirectly helping the, of course, gold, but it's also helping to say that, yes, there are still pressure on interest rate, but it's probably uh, and more likely that we need to keep a watch out for euro dollar. You know, God forbid for people short euro dollar that US actually, uh, Europe actually come up with a little bit better manufacturing data over the course of the next one to two months. And all of a sudden we could be talking 110, 112. Again, that would help the goal. So number one goal. Number two, uh, energy and energy stocks in particular. <clears throat> I think most... Uh, uh, listeners and, and viewers of this show will know XLE, the ETFs, uh, it's doing mm. phenomenally. It uh, has huge dividends, uh, buybacks, it has, uh, and buybacks, <clears throat> pun, it's, uh, it's strong. So energy and energy stocks. And then thirdly, your Swiss. I mean, anyone ever grown up in the foreign exchange market is always going to your Swiss, and that is still the, the one currency that seems to work. Of course, to some extent, built on the fact that SMB, as the only central bank in the world, allowed the strongest Swiss rank to kill uh, the, the the very high inflation they also initially saw. So they have immense uh, credibility on inflation fighting in, in Switzerland relative to the rest of the world that sees high inflation, fiscal spend. None of this exists in, in Switzerland. Hence, of course, uh, these three tools. So gold, energy, energy stocks as, as number two, and number three, short your Swiss. Steen, the final question um, for this show in relation to your view on, on energy and energy stocks, it's a topic that we've discussed uh, week in and week out on this show. Also, whether energy is is actually the new fixed income in portfolio allocations. Uh, but I wanted to get your take on the outlook for Q4 and energy prices, because it seems very obvious that there is kind of a deficit in, in oil markets as a consequence of Saudi Arabia's supply cuts. So how do you view this situation uh, with Saudi Arabia now that we have, at least we're counting the hours before we have Israeli boots on the grounds uh, in, in Gaza? So to take the question from the opposite side, the reason why oil is not higher is that the U.S. is increasing uh, its oil production and it is the biggest mm. oil producers in the world right now. So said that's sort of why we're not much higher in energy prices. If we look at uh, Iran and the, and leading into this conflict, Iran was allowed to uh, get increasingly be part of the bigger sort of global uh, energy uh, supply. I would expect fully that uh, they they will be curfewed now. Probably the reason why we have seen U.S. accept Venezuelan oil over the course of the last mm. 24 hours. 
but the net, 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 the net demand on, on energy is unchanged. The global population is increasing. I mean, there is a reason why, Andreas, your, your iPhone is getting bigger. It's not because it's smart. It's simply because the amount of electricity that you need to put on to run all the fancy apps that you run is increasing. So electricity demand is increasing somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. And everything we have done today, you and I, has involved electricity. It will involve electricity for the rest of the day. So you can say that uh, JP Morgan could also rephrase uh, my, my quote on, on gold is uh, is money. Uh, some people would say energy is money and the rest is paper. Mm. So maybe it's energy and, and gold is, is, is money and, and everything else is paper. I think that's pretty clear. I think there is still a huge underestimation of how critical supply of energy, uh, security of energy, delivered energy is. And and as you know, Andreas, I have a few jobs in the shipping industries. And mm. uh, the just to give uh, the, the, the sort of what's happened to freight waste, we were trading very, very uh, uh, weak, 10, 10 to $15,000 a day for VLC uh, tankers. Now we are north of 50, 60,000. It's not, I mean, it's a famously volatile market, but it's pretty clear that uh, to transport all around the world now, you need to go through and beneath uh, Cape Horn. You can't use really the Suez Canal. That adds number of travel days. It adds distance. Uh, and as such, uh, every single uh, sort of logistical point in, in energy delivery is getting more expensive. So maybe, again, back to where we started, uh, uh, an early warning that uh, people hoping for lower inflation this winter is probably going to have to watch very, very closely the energy situation. And and mm. you know, I have no ability to predict, but I'll be very surprised if we didn't trade hundred dollars in the WTI uh, during the course of the next one to two months. Because as we you and I talked today, we are still in the early part of the escalation of what goes on in the Middle East. We're in the early parts of the ramification on the geopolitical uh, trade patterns in terms of uh, sanction on Russia, additional sanction on Russia, additional sanction on Iran. Uh, the inclusions of uh, Venezuela on the sort of the positive side, but net net, we we will lose. It's more likely we lose capacity than we get capacity to the world market. Hmm. Stephen Jacobsen of Saxo Bank, thank you very much for being with us here at Macro Sunday. Always a pleasure to host you. Back from the interview with Stephen Jacobsen, what a great guy. Also very knowledgeable around how to hedge your portfolio against some of the risks that we discussed in um, global markets over the course of the coming quarters. One thing I took particular notice of was his view that um, the U.S. easing of sanctions on uh, Venezuela uh, was something uh, to bear in mind for oil bulls, um, since it can be construed as a clear hint that sanctions on Russia, Iran, etc. will be increased as a consequence of everything that's ongoing in uh, Gaza. So from a geopolitical perspective, the oil bet uh, has received some new quote-unquote fuel over the course of the past week. Uh, and I'm still of the view, um, and basically it seems like Stein shares that view, that the oil market is so physically tight that Gravity basically calls in an upwards direction. Um, I think it's been uh, clear that market positioning uh, needed a squeeze. Um, and we've had a very uniform consensus view around higher oil prices. Um, that needed to take a beating. Um, but now, timing-wise, it seems pretty feasible to go long uh, the oil bed. Once again, um, it's very, very... Uh, typical that we see strong performance in energy ahead of a recession. Um, so even if you have, say, Q1 or Q2 playbook uh, for the recession outlook, then it still makes sense to be long oil right until that actual recession is is actually here. Uh, so if we look at it from a portfolio perspective, um, I still like, as of today, as of today's pricing, uh, the curve steepener. Uh, I think the geopolitical picture fuels that curve steepener as well. Uh, I think the Japanese case fuels that curve steepener as well. And um, if we get some tailwind to the energy complex again, that will certainly fuel that curve steepener trade as well. Uh, also, natural gas looks like an interesting uh, or rather compelling uh, supply-demand uh, story from here. 
uh, we have the issue very short term that the bet will be very weather dependent uh, due to uh, inventories running above uh, normal ranges for for this time of the year, uh, meaning that we need colder weather uh, for a, a sort of a more constructive bullish price action in the front month contract, both in the US and in Europe. But as soon as we get that, uh, I, I strongly uh, sense that the supply dynam dynamics still support the bull case for natural gas over the course of the winter. Um, with clear signs, signs now that we have a restocking cycle ongoing, both in the US, also with signs of such in Germany and in China, um, it is very clear that the industrial demand for natural gas is uh, on the way up. And given that the supply side is so constrained still, uh, that is something that sooner or later will uh, likely pass through to, to pricing. So uh, along the front month, Henry Hub, um, with a bit of weather risk in that uh, bit, obviously, um, along the curve steepener, two tens in the US dollar curve seems like a very great idea. Uh, also from current levels, we simply need it to uninvert, uh, to tempt back foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries. And now that Biden has not only one but two um, wars to fund, uh, he's asking for 100 billion uh, in Congress. Then uh, we know that the issuance pace will will remain extremely high. So, for the sake of everyone, we need a steeper yield curve in the U.S. And I think it's the best risk reward or even the safest risk reward out there to continue to steepen the dollar curve as a consequence. That was it for the special edition of Macro Sunday, uh, live from Mallorca, Spain. Um, I hope you enjoyed the content. If anything, leave us uh, a comment or an email and uh, we'll take uh, great notice of such feedback. If you enjoyed this show, um, I am here to announce that we have a great offer for everyone listening to the podcast. Macro 3.0, so Macro 30. As the coupon code gives you 30% off your first subscription at stenoresearch.com, where we have our live portfolio, our data tools, our 25, 30 articles a week with coverage of everything from geopolitics to finance across the globe. That was all for this week's edition of Macro Sunday. My name is Andrea Stino. I'll see you again next week. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit.